bound by the law. That's what I'm going to speak about today. We're still on the idea of the supernatural and wanting to, uh, to see the supernatural happen in the church because that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Can you turn me up just a hair and see if that doesn't, doesn't start ringing? There, that's, that's just a little bit better, isn't it? Yeah, praise God. No longer bound by the law, I was studying uh, in Romans and suddenly saw this that I hadn't really processed mentally before. I'm sure it's the Holy Spirit. But look at these texts. We're going we're gonna to break up. We're not going to look at all of Romans 7, but we're going to look at quite a bit. If we're going to look at all of it, it, it would even be clearer, but there just isn't time or space to do that. Uh, just the first three verses alone, and we'll go through a few of the verses, but Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. He, he says, I'm, I'm speaking to the people that know the law. In other words, a lot of people didn't know anything about the law um, in that day, and we are, we are blessed that we know more about the law today because of... Uh, There, that's better. Know not the brethren, for I speak to them that know not the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For as a woman, you know, now he's going to go from the law, and he's going to speak about a lady, and if we're to look at, and her husband, and if we're to look at this just as, just as it is, um, it has information that's good, but that's not what he's really talking about. That's not the point he's trying to make. He says, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no longer an adulteress, though she is married to another man. The husband died. The husband died, and that set the lady free. That set the bride free. So the question is, who's the bride and who's the bridegroom he's talking about here? Who's the bride and who's the bridegroom? Jesus is the bridegroom. And the church is the bride. When the husband dies, the bride is no longer bound by that marriage. We, you know, this is, this is something to really... We are no longer bound by the law. We, we can't seem to get that through our heads. We are no longer bound by the law as children of God. Uh, we've been taught our whole lives about the law, about rules and keeping rules to make people happy and to please people. And that, that, unfortunately, that flows over into pleasing God through the law. And Paul couldn't make any clearer. He says when the bride dies, I mean when the, when the groom dies, then the bride is no longer under the law. And what did our bridegroom do? What did he do? He died. He died. Praise God, He resurrected again. But He died, and we're no longer bound by the law. And that's the point that Paul is trying to make to the Hebrews that lived in Rome at the time. And he's saying, you're no longer bound by the law. And, and if we can get that through our thinking, the law has nothing on us anymore. The law has nothing on us anymore. When the husband brought... When the, when the husband dies, the bride is no longer bound by that marriage. Paul is speaking to those who are of the law, which is basically anyone who isn't saved. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyone who isn't saved is still bound by the law. They're married to that law. Jesus was the perfect <coughs> manifestation of the law. So when He died, the conditions or the control of the law died with Him. According to Scriptures, the husband and wife are one. So anyone who is the wife of Jesus is as a result dead to the law. We, we are, Jesus died so that we were set free from the law and we're no longer bound by the law. Now we want to use the law because we, we want people to be good. We want people to behave themselves and, 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 and treat each other appropriately. And, and to an extent, that's good, but it's not realistic. It's not realistic. We're selfish. We're selfish people apart from the love of God. We're selfish people, and we're always looking out for ourselves. Even when, we're, even when we keep the law, and, and we think we're a pretty good person, we become self-righteous, and we're focused on ourselves still. And, you know, and when Jesus was talking to Martha and Mary, 
Martha was busy about doing her work, trying to prepare for these people that were all coming over. And, and Mary was sitting by his feet listening to Jesus. And he said, and Martha got upset and she got all self-righteous. And she said, I'm doing all these wonderful things that, that we should be doing. And Jesus says, it's a nice thing you're doing, but what Mary's doing is better. And if we can get that across in our minds that, yeah, the law is nice and we should do nice things for other people, but for the most part, that motivation is, is not right. It's just not right. Um, we're, in, we're involved in several community groups, and I don't want to specify any particular one, but there's people in there that are, that are not saved. They're very secular, and they're doing wonderful, nice things for people. And why are they doing them? They're doing them for the wrong reason. They're doing them for themselves. They're doing it so they feel better about themselves, or they do it because they need the, the attention. Everybody, and, and you, you just watch this in your own life, everybody is, is seeking significance. I want to be important to somebody somewhere. I want to be recognized by somebody somewhere. Everybody's seeking significance. And, and this is just us. And, and if I went into the whole thing and how Paul talks about the law and, and how he doesn't do what he wants to do but does what he doesn't want to do and all that kind of stuff, the point he's trying to make is that, is that we're always self-motivated. We're, all, we're always motivated to somehow... Uh, you know, it's interesting. I used to teach, you know, the, the train the people at Campbell's and I always told them that, you know, when they're trying to work in teams... And, and the people couldn't get along in the teams, I'd say, you know, everybody judges other people based on their actions, but they judge themselves based on their intent. I meant to do this. I meant this to happen. But when we look at other people, we don't know what they meant to happen. And so we look at them and say, oh, aren't they, wonder aren't they evil people? They did this thing wrong. You know, if, if we come late, we can think of all the good reasons why we were late. If somebody else is late and we're on time or early, then we're, we, we think of, oh, they just don't care. They don't, and, they, and if they begin to tell us what they are supporting their intent on, we just think all oh, those are just all poor excuses. You know, we don't verbalize that usually to their face, but we think that to ourselves. So the point being is that, that we aren't going to get right by ourselves. There ain't no way we're going to get right by ourselves. No matter how, no matter how good we are, no, how, no matter how appropriate we act in the church, that's why Jesus went through that whole list and he says, these people are, are, are going to go to hell. And gossip was one of them. How far do we get in a day without speaking ill of somebody else? Even, uh, you know, even in prayer, I can remember when I was at the Baptist church in Blair, I had to shut down the prayer group and the, and the ladies got very mad at me, but they had a prayer group that met on a regular basis and all it was was a gossip group. You know, well, let's pray for Sally because this is going on in her life. And they'd spend 10 minutes talking about what was going on in Sally's life and about two seconds praying for her. Because what they wanted to do was really, and when we came down here, and Lynn could tell you, I faced the same thing down here. We had a, a ladies' prayer group, and it was a gossip group. And I'm not just picking on the ladies. Men are just as bad. I've just given those two examples. And um, we think that we're good. We like to think that we're good, but we're not. We're not good. With, apart from Christ, apart from the love of God, we, we haven't got much of anything but self-centeredness. And uh, that sounds too broad. Generally, you say, well, I know somebody that's just wonderful. You know, I, I can remember my grandma. She was just wonderful. And I don't know what the motivations of her heart was. But she's just a wonderful lady. I just love her. And so, I, you know, maybe I'm brushing the brush too widely here. But uh, Jesus said there's none good, no, not one. Uh, my Father in Heaven is the only good one. And so, so we we're, don't try and do it because we think we're a pretty good person, because that ain't that just in that just isn't that just isn't. There isn't one of us. It says none that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's none that are good. No, not one. And um, so God couldn't make that any plainer. You know, even as and I was thinking about it, as it was talking about adultery and stuff here, even as Jesus spoke to the to the people on the Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, of course, there was Pharisees and Sadducees and, and, and scribes and teachers and lawyers there from the, from, the, from the church at that time, which was Israel and Judaism. And, um, and, and he looked at those guys and he says, you know, if you've done it in your mind, 
If you've done it in your mind, you've done it in your heart, then you've done it. The, the sin is there. Don't, don't tell me that you keep from sinning because you're a good person. You actually don't carry out your thoughts. The fact that you carry out the thoughts. Now, he wasn't doing that to judge them. He wasn't doing that to, to pick on them. You know, as we look at how he talked to the Pharisees, we think he was picking on them. He was trying to just get in their face and say, you guys are sinners too. You need, you need salvation. You need God to save your souls. And don't be fooled thinking that you're this wonderful thing because if you've thought the thought, you've done it. If you just even had the thought, you've, you've done it. So what I'm trying to get the point across is there ain't no way we're going to do anything by the law, by being good people. There's no way that we're going to please God through our fasting and prayer and through seeking Him and all this. We, we are only... We are only purified and prepared to do the supernatural because Jesus Christ died and put an end to the law and He married us again when we gave our lives to Him. We became His bride or bride-to-be and we'll be married to Him on the, in the marriage supper of the Lamb. But we're now His bride no longer under the law because He took care of the law and when we, when we gave our life to Christ, we're no longer bound by the law. So, so seeking and trying to discover how we can do the supernatural is not going to be found in our actions. It's not going to be found in our behavior. It's going to be found in renewed minds that understand the Word of God, and the Word of God is more real to us than the things of this world. And it's not because, oh, if I study the Word of God, God will be pleased with me, and then, then He'll let me do miraculous things. No, God is pleased with you because of Jesus Christ. The reason He gave you your word, the Word is so that your mind would be renewed and you no longer depend on the law. That's why He's talking to these people about the law. He spends an extensive amount of time in Romans talking about you're no longer under the law. And here's the church and we think that we are under the law. And you say, well, pastor, I'm saved by grace. I don't think I'm under the law. Well, just try to go for 10 minutes without judging somebody based on your own behaviors or, or what you think is right or what you think is wrong. Try and, try and go a day without, uh, w without sinning if you think you're self-righteous. It, it, it's not going to work. It, it only comes from Jesus Christ. We can't do enough. There's nothing we can do enough except for understand the Word of God and have our minds transformed to knowing what truth is instead of what we believe. If this seems harsh, I'm sorry. This is just what Paul is saying. He says, you're no longer bound by the law. And I can't make it any clearer, he says. The guy dies, and the ladies can go can go marry another guy, and she's not she's not uh, committing adultery. Jesus died on the cross for us. He was all man and all God. He was perfect. He was the perfect manifestation of the law kept at every jot and every tittle in his life. And he died, and the law died with him. And the law died with him. And as we give Him our lives, and we become in relationship with Jesus Christ, as we become in relationship with Jesus Christ, we've married the new man. We've married the resurrected Jesus. And we'll go to the, to the great marriage supper of the Lamb so that eternally we'll never have to struggle with the law and good and bad behavior and self-centeredness ever again or self-righteousness ever again when we get to heaven. But in the flesh, Paul goes on to say, in the flesh it's still a battle. In the flesh it's still a battle, but the battle really isn't can I be a good person? The battle is, can I transform my mind so I know what truth is instead of what I've reasoned to be truth? Because see, we reason what's to be true. Just as I said, when we judge other people by their actions and judge ourselves by our intent. If we show up to church late one day, and we can figure that all out. And when every eye turns to you and looks at you walking in late, you think to yourself, well, you're late about every fifth time. I'm only late this one time in a hundred. You see? And you're thinking those thoughts. And you're defending yourself. You're defending yourself against judgment. You're defending yourself against the law. We don't need to think those thoughts. We need to be delivered of those kinds of thoughts. We need to be set free from our, our criticism and judgmental of others. But that's not going to make us purer or holier. That's just going to make us more understanding of the truth of the Word of God. Romans, uh, okay, the law is no longer has a hold on anyone who is the bride of Christ. We were nailed together at the cross with Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 7, 4 through 6. And this is even longer than the last one, I think, but 
Therefore, my brethren, you have also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. We're dead to the law. The law is absolutely dead to us. That you should be married to another, even to him, Jesus, who is raised from the dead. There it is, just what I was talking about. It's right there. It couldn't be any clearer. Therefore, my brethren, you have also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him, Jesus, who is raised from the dead. He just talked about it. He said you were dead, you would become dead to the law by his death on the cross, by the body of Jesus Christ. And that you should be married to another, another, you see that? Another. Jesus Christ, we're going to be married to another, even him, Jesus, who is raised from the dead. Do you see that? You see what I'm saying? A minute ago you were thinking, gee, you know, I, I'm married to the same Jesus that went to the cross and now he's the resurrected Jesus. I didn't say they're two different people. Paul says they're two different people. Paul says they're two different people. He said you have become dead by the law of the body of Christ. You should be married to another, even to him, Jesus, who is raised from the dead. That we should bring forth the fruit of God unto God. That we... The purpose of this new marriage is that we can bring we can bring fruit from our lives to, 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 to praise and glorify God. For when we were in the flesh, the passions of the sins which we were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, being dead to that which we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Now, we cannot turn this into the law. Be careful. Don't turn this into the law and say, oh, now that I'm a Christian, now that I'm born again, now that I'm in relationship with Jesus Christ, I should do good things. That's not what it's saying. It's saying this should be a fruit of your life, of the Spirit in you, the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Galatians 2.20, the next text says, I am crucified with Christ. So I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, not yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't live by me anymore. I don't live by the old me. Because the old me doesn't understand this word. The old me understands the thoughts that I have. The old me understands the reasoning and the, the complications of life that I've created in my own mind. But it says you don't live by that anymore. You live by what's the truth. You live by Christ. Christ said, I am the truth. I come to set you free. We live by the truth. We live by Jesus Christ and what's in the Word. And we have to renew our minds. And that's only going to happen about by, by regular study and prayer with God. Not because that makes Him happy, but because it transforms us into that new person that we need to be. And I wish I could say we could listen to Christian radio and get that same effect, but, but so much of the Christian radio now is pablum. It's baby food. It, they, they're just giving you... They're, not, they're, not, they're, they're talking about the, the works of God are dead. I mean, we got all these people speaking all these things to us uh, on, on the radio that don't believe that Jesus Christ is, is working in the church today in a miraculous way. So they have a form of godliness, but the power that, that they deny the, the power thereof. Oh yeah, they'll say, well, I don't deny the power because I believe somebody is saved by grace, and that's the real power of the Word of God. The power of the Word of God, over and over and over again, if you read the Bible, is to demonstrate the fact that God is working through us, His children. Romans 8, 1 through 2 says, There is therefore no, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free, has made me free from the law of sin and death. After we go through all of seven, and, and like I said, we're not going to go through all of seven, we're going we're to touch on parts of seven, but, but after we go through seven, after we go through seven, if, if we were to sit down, and I encourage you to do that, if you go all the way through seven, you notice something in Romans 8, 1, what does it say? There is therefore now no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus. This, is, this isn't necessarily a new, a new chapter. We can't start there. That's actually the end of chapter 7. He goes through all these verses on the law, of which I only showed you six, but he goes through all these verses on the law, and then at the end of that, he says, and as a result, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He's trying to say you're free from the law. You're no longer bound by the law. 
And we're not going to see supernatural, miraculous things happen because we spend a bunch of time uh, in prayer trying to seek a, some sort of a new relationship with God. We're, we're, going to be, we're going to be transformed by that prayer. We're going to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit during that prayer time. Don't get me wrong. Prayer is important and, and it's very significant. It gives the opportunity to the Holy Spirit to change us. But it's this Word that transforms us. It's knowing what this Word says. And, you know, I think it's interesting because you'd say, well, some people can't read, so how could they study the Word of Law? But it says in here that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If, if you can't read it, you can hear it. You can go somewhere and listen to it. I don't know who to tell you to listen to it, apart from Andrew Womack and, and Heidi Baker and those kinds of people that believe God really works in His people and through His people today. I can't tell you to listen to the other guys because they deny the power of God. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. So I think everybody in here can read. So I suggest that you begin reading the Word of God on a regular, regular basis so that your mind will be renewed and read it like not a story tale uh, or a fairy tale or like something that's just interesting reading. Read it as if it is going to change how you think so that when you read, there is therefore no condemnation in Christ. Uh, those are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. It's simply saying that you pursue the Spirit of God through the Word of God and you're a changed person. And there's no condemnation. Is there no condemnation? Is this, is this Word true or not? Are we no longer bound by the law or not? Are we no longer bound by the law? We're no longer bound by the law. I don't know if I'm sounding kind of enthusiastic here, but I just really, through the praise and worship time and through the time coming up here, I just really felt the presence of the Holy Spirit on me. He wants to communicate to this to you that you are no longer bound by the law. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's, that's the finish of, of chapter 7, not really the beginning of chapter 8. The only way that, can, that, that this can benefit the loss is for them to become the bride, and that comes from accepting Jesus as a groom. If you're not one with Jesus, you're still bound by the law. That's true. The only way to become one with Jesus is to accept His proposal and become His bride. He, he makes a proposal to us. Is this becoming clear? Jesus makes a proposal to His bride. And His bride, He's saying to His bride, come and be with Me. Come and share what I have. Come and be in relationship with Me. Come and, 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 and take all that I have to give you. And, and, and we either say, yes, I do, or no, I don't. And, and I want you to think about this for a second. Some of you are married, some of you aren't. We're married, Margie and I, and have been for 45 plus years. Others in here are married or have been married. And why did you get married? You got married because you were in love with that other individual. You were in love with that other individual. And, and are you in love with Christ? The reason people don't accept Christ as their Lord and Savior is they're not in love with Him. They're not in love with Him. We are lovers of Jesus Christ. The people that are here today, we are lovers of Jesus Christ. And we accepted His proposal to be His bride. And in doing that, we have been released from the law. People say they fall out of love. I, I wonder if they were ever really in love to begin with. Because love, you know, if you go through 1 Corinthians, love is just sacrificing everything for the other individual. It's giving up everything for the other individual. Apart from, apart from being his bride, you're doomed. <laughs> but in the marriage, you're no longer a carnal person, but become one with Jesus and seated with him at the right hand of God. And, and it's, read this in Ephesians 5. Look what it says there. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. This is us. We're members of his body, members of his flesh, members of his bone. Now look what this is so this is so cool. And it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too, and they too, number two, shall be one flesh. But this is the great mystery. I'm not speaking about the husband and wife. I'm speaking about Christ and his church. You see, he, he just continually trying to get the point across that when we become the bride of Christ, and he's our bridegroom, 
We are no longer us. We are Him. We are one with Him. And He doesn't sin and we don't sin. And the reason we don't sin is not because we don't sin in the flesh. That's what Paul covers in, in the rest of Romans 7. It's because of what our heart attitude is. We're in love with Jesus. We're one with Him. And even though our flesh may do things that are wrong and inappropriate and, and, and not according to the law, we're never breaking the law because we're in union with Christ. We are His and He is ours. It says, for we are members of His body, of His flesh and of His bones. We are members of His body, of His flesh and His bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. He's saying the example here on earth of two people becoming one flesh is marriage. But he says, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Jesus Christ and His church. He just brought it down to a plane that people could understand is all he was doing. He's, you know, people use this to teach all oh, the husband and wife become one flesh and all this when they get married. That's not what this is about, even though it can be taught that way. What this is really about from a spiritual standpoint is that we're no longer us. We are Him. We are the manifestation of Christ here on earth in our spirit, carried around by this tent that's going to dissolve one day, called our flesh. We are not us, we're Him. And look at this, Ephesians 2, 6 and 7 says, And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Wow, you see what this is saying? It's saying, it's saying it's not about us at all. It's about Him wanting to bless our socks off for eternity. That's what it says. And He raised us up, this, uh, up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. It didn't say we had the opportunity to sit together in heavenly places. It said He made us to sit together in heavenly places. When we married Him through accepting Jesus Christ's proposal, when we accepted that proposal and became Him and He became us, and it said he made us to sit together in heavenly places. Sit over here next to me. Because of all the benefits you get from sitting next to me. It doesn't say, oh, I earned it through struggling and I'm a better Christian than the next person, or I, I praise God more, I have a, a tender spirit, I read the word more, or anything. It says he made us to sit together with him in heavenly places. He made that. When we accepted the proposal, he grabbed us and sat us down next to him. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, so yeah, i got to get this right because you guys are backwards from me, but here's, here's God, and it's not me, and then next to Him on His right side, his, Jesus is left and, and God's right. It's backwards for you guys or not. But, and then we're seated next to Him on His right side. So I'm on the right side of Jesus all the time. So I can't do anything to get on the wrong side of Jesus because you know what? If I got on the wrong side of Jesus, I'd be next to God and that's not my place. You, you think of that? I can't, be between, I can't get between Him and God because He's got His place next to God, right? And I can't sit on the other place, on the other side next to God because that's not my place. I don't, have that, I don't have that place. Now there's people who like to think they do, but they don't have that place. And I get to sit on the right hand of Jesus Christ. Here's His right hand. I get to sit on the right hand of Jesus Christ. What? That's your right hand. Yeah, that's right, my right hand. But I'm just using an example because you guys are looking at me backwards. But, but this is the right hand, and so I'm sitting, I'm sitting next to him. So my left hand is engaged with his right hand, and I'm there because he put me there. Not because I want to be there, or because I worshipped him enough, or prayed enough, or studied the word enough, or because I was a good enough person. I'm there because he put me there because I accepted his proposal. And he did that so that he could show me the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness to me through Jesus Christ. It says that in ages to come, he might show, God might show his exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. And God's sitting there and Jesus is sitting next to him. I'm sitting next to Jesus. God's looking over and saying, how's it going, Jim? You really appreciating all my blessings? You really appreciate all, my, all the things I give you? And, and, I, and I was sitting here, we were, we were, I wasn't sitting, I was standing and praising God during praise and worship. And, and 
I was thinking, oh God, I wish more people were here. And you know, some people visited the last week and they said, oh, we're coming back and they didn't. And, and uh, I'm thinking, oh Lord, where's all the people in the pews? And he says, wait a minute, Jim. He says, what of all the wonderful blessings that you have? And I began to think of, of, of my grandkids, my grandson that's here videotaping. And I began to think of my other grandkids and, and uh, my, my older granddaughters and, and, and think about my wife and, and what, we've, what we've produced together out of the two of us and the two lives. And my parents, and they're still living, you know, and, and the food and, you know, everything that we've got. My goodness sakes, everything we got. We could be out living under a tree with a cardboard box wrapped around us. I got no business asking God. I said, you know, if it's your will, bring more people. I know it's your will because you said you'll build the church and the gates and I won't prevail against it. So you'll fill these pews, Lord. I know that. And it's not got anything to do with whether I'm a good person or a bad person. It says the only condition about this working out is if I study to show myself approved. A workman of God. And you know what? The more I study, the more I see the things in here that are just incredible. That are just incredible. We're supernatural beings because we accept an proposal of God. And we have supernatural things to go do. And, and because the rest of the church doesn't want to believe that, because there's a, a, a large proportion of the church that doesn't want to believe that, I hope they're saved. I, I truly hope they're saved. But, but it says in here that we're going to do all this stuff, and it's nonsense to think that there's some reason that we can't do that stuff today. It's just nonsense. Jeremiah says this in 33, 2 through 3. And, you know, this doesn't go away. This is still there. And people used to say this is, this is God's phone number, uh, Jeremiah 3, 3, 2, 3. Thus says the Lord, the maker of the heaven, the maker of the earth, the Lord that formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call, and this is what God says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you know not. Wow. Call on him. Just call on him. You know, it says, we miss that. It says, God draws near to us because we draw near to him. It says, call on him. Call on him and he'll show us great and mighty wonders that we don't even know about. Call on him. Call on him. You know, it, you know there's, there's people in the body that are struggling with various illnesses and we do all this research on the internet and every time try to think, figure out what man knows about these sicknesses and diseases yet. And, 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 and he says, just sincerely call on him. And he'll show you things that you don't know anything about. He, he knows all about cancer. He knows all about heart disease. He knows all about strokes. He knows all about these things. He knows all about these things. And he says, call on him. And, and if you really want, if you really want these things to come apart, to, come, to pass, then call on him. Call on him in a sincere way. And not full of doubt and unbelief. Oh, he doesn't really care about me. He doesn't really, he, he likes somebody else better because I got this disease and they don't. No, that's, that's wrong. He cares about you all the same, but not because of anything you did. Other than accept the proposal of Jesus Christ, you become his body, his blood, and, and his flesh, and, and, he, and you are him and he is you, and you're seated next to God in the heavenly places. We've got to get out of our thinking that we have position with God or place with God because of something we've done. It's, it's all Him. It's all Him to demonstrate the, the incredibleness of, of His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. And He says, call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Thus says the Lord, the maker of the earth, that established that. He made it all. The Lord that formed it, if there was any question in your mind, He didn't have any help. He did it all by Himself. And he established it. That means he, that means he created all the government, all the laws, all the rules. He, he created gravity. He created how the earth spun. And he created you know, where gold is and where silver is. He created all that. He created each and every one of us and the soul and spirit that's in us. He created each, everything. And, and what it is, it says the Lord is his name. If you don't know who he is, the Lord's his name, right? Right. And he says, call unto me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things which you know not. He, it just couldn't be clear. I made everything. Uh, you know, this is the Lord speaking to and through Jeremiah. And he said, he said, I made everything. Um, if you don't know who he is, his, his name is the Lord. And, and he says, call unto me. And I'll answer you. And I'll show you great and mighty things you don't know anything about. Hallelujah.
you know, we try and understand everything. I, you know, if there was some recipe in here of how to lay hands on people and get healed, and there's some, there's some indications of things we need to do, but if there was some recipe in here, then, then anybody could do it. And that's not what it's about. He says he wants to show you things you don't know anything about. His ways are so far above our ways. We, we just we continue to try and pull him down to some, somebody or something we can put our arms around and you just can't. First Thessalonians 1 5. You know the one thing you can put your arms around about him? Is he loves you to pieces. He loves you to pieces. He loves every part of you, he loves every soul in your body, every cell in your body. He loves every cell in your body. You only got one soul, so of course he loves every soul in your body, but he loves every cell in your body. 1 Thessalonians 1 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit, in, in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we are among you for your sake. You know what this is saying? It says, you know what kind of a person somebody is, what kind of a preacher somebody is, what kind of a teacher somebody is. By what? He says, not in word only, but in power. He says, you know, you know we're really Christians. You know we're really representative of Christ. Not just by what we tell you, but by the results in our lives. We can't keep disguising all this and shoving it all aside and saying, well, that's some other dispensation. This is the Word of God. And if we claim to be full gospel people and that we take the truth of the full gospel, then, then you know, some of these people don't or they choose not to. But, but, but it says that the reason you know who we are is because also in power in the Holy Spirit. The power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. You know, there's too much of the church today that has no power, and they have no Holy Spirit, and all they got is a bunch of words. And I'd say that's a high percentage of the pastors that are preaching today. And, and please don't think I think I'm something special or different. I, I'm really not trying to do that. I'm just trying to get us on the right path. That's all. I'm just trying to get us on the right path. I'm trying to get me on the right path, and, and hopefully, because he's putting me in this position before you guys that that you're, you're seeking that same thing in your heart. I'm just trying to get on the right path. And maybe all those other people are too, but maybe they're just taking a different route. I don't, I don't know. There's, when I do my Garmin to, to travel around the country, there's several different routes I can take. Uh, there's one that's fastest. There's one that's shortest. Um, there's one that's most pretty or whatever. I, you know, the... Scenic. What? Scenic. Scenic, yeah, thank you. My wife said it's not pretty, it's scenic, yeah. And so, um, 1 Corinthians uh, 2 through 4 says, In my speech and my preaching, we're not with enticing words of myth wisdom. There's plenty of that. There's plenty of that, guys. Some really good speakers. Turn on your Christian radio, get their tapes. You know, there's some really good, good speakers, and they have enticing words but in demonstration of spirit and power. That's what Paul said. What I came to you with is, is spirit and power. I came with the Holy Ghost and power. And, and we can shove that aside and say, oh, that was for some other times. But uh, that just isn't the truth because that's not for another time. It's for the church right now and right today. And the only thing that's blocking us from us is not Jesus. It's not, the, not our behavior. It's... it's uh, an understanding of what truth is and getting the truth inside our brain and inside of our heart. A lot of us have it in our brain but don't have it in our heart. You know how many people know John 3.16 for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. You know how many people know that and aren't saved? They got it in their heads but they've never, they've never accepted the marriage proposal from Jesus Christ. And they say, oh God loves me and God cares about me and yada 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 but if they haven't accepted the proposal if they haven't accepted that proposal, truly accepted that proposal, then, then they're no better off than, than, uh, than any other lost person. The only thing they might have is that the word won't fall void, but it'll go forth to what it's supposed to do. It doesn't say it will necessarily save their soul. It says it'll go forth to do what it's supposed to do. The word will go forth to do what it's supposed to do. The word will go forth to do what it's supposed to do. 
And in some cases, if if you remember what I spoke on last week, I said that that, that so that God is free to judge us. If people have heard the word and they say, oh, God is love, but I'm not accepting the marriage proposal of Jesus because I don't want to be one of those odd people that go to church every Sunday and Wednesday and, and uh, Sunday nights, and, and I have no intention of doing that. i got my own life. I don't have time for those people. I don't even like those people. So I'm not accepting that proposal of Jesus Christ. I just know God is love and He'll take care of things. Well, He will. He'll send you to hell because you've judged yourself and, and that's where you are. It'll go forth to do what it's supposed to do. To the surrendered person that accepts the proposal, they'll send them to heaven. To the rebellious person that refuses to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, they'll go to hell. It'll go forth to do what it's supposed to do. Acts 28, 8-9, And it came to pass that the father of, of Publius lay sick of a fever and of dysentery, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, Others also who had diseases in the island came and were healed. You see what that says? It says he went and healed one person and then people began to line up. You know, if we can truly, if we can truly pray for somebody and see him healed, they're going to line up. This guy had no deep sickness. He had a, he had a, a, a flu or something, whatever, and had dysentery, which is an awful thought. I mean, he didn't have that. And Paul went and prayed for him and the guy said, whoa, I'm all better. I'm all better. And they said, oh, he's all better. Let's line up. He didn't like heal a blind person or anything like that. He healed somebody of the flu. And people lined up to get healed. People lined up to get the flu shot. Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, I'm not, you do whatever you want with your body, but, but uh, um, you do whatever you want with your body, but I don't get the flu shot personally. Neither do I. Yeah. I heard a guy speak on it the other day. And he says, you know, they tell you that the, 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 the whatever it is the the thing that they use that they use a, a piece of the flu you know that's dormant dead and and they put that in your body then your body builds up immunities to it and he, then he began to list all the stuff that was in the shot and he says yeah the flu that goes in you is dead but then he lists all this other stuff that's in the shot to make the shot go into you and, and work and my gosh and, and I, I had the flu shot once and I got sick. Now I know why I got sick. He described everything that was in there and what it does to your body. And I'm like, oh, no wonder I got sick. I had nothing to do with the, the, the flu shot. It was all the carriers that they used to, to get in my system. Please don't. If you like flu shots, get flu shots. I don't get flu shots, but you get flu shots if you want. My point is, is this guy had the flu or something very close to that. And Paul prayed for him. And when he did, people lined up to get, to get healed. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how it works. That's how it works. And because it don't work that way for us, we don't do it that way, that doesn't change what it says in here. That doesn't change what it says in here. If I say, oh, oh, that's, that's, that's gone on to another time, so I'll cover up my left eye when I read the Word. Or maybe I should cover up my right eye when I read the Word, and I'll just only read the parts that, that match with my theology. Well, that's not what it says here. It says they lined up because, because he did that. Acts 9.40. But Peter put them. But Peter put them all forth, knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body said, "Tabitha, arise!" And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He raised her from the dead. One guy's got the flu; somebody else is raised from the dead. Well, that was for another time, Pastor Jim. That's for not for now. It doesn't say that anywhere. It doesn't say that. There's one place in First Corinthians 13 or somewhere that they use, or 12, or where maybe it's. I, yeah, I don't remember. I think it's in 13. It says these things will pass away. These things will pass away. And, uh, and it mentions tongues. And so they say, well, that must mean the Holy Spirit and all that kind of stuff. So that's going to pass away. And God will heal whomever He wants to heal. That's not what the Word of God says. God says He'll heal who we go and lay hands on and pray for. That's what the Word of God says. I'm sorry, I can't help it. That's what the Word of God says. It doesn't say that He'll, he, he'll heal whom He wants to heal and and not heal who he, who he didn't want to heal. It, there's inferences to those kinds of things, and people build whole theologies about that. But over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, it says they went and laid hands on him and they got healed. That was the acts of the church. That's a demonstration of what we're supposed to be doing. See, you've got the Old Testament that tells you pretty much what you're not supposed to be doing. And it gives you the law that you can't keep so that you that you find yourself, like it says in Galatians, the law was just a teacher to lead us to Christ. 
and and then and then we got the gospels that of Jesus showing us how it's done, right? And then then we've got then we've got the acts of the church that that shows us the acts of the church which which shows us how the 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 new church did it, right? And then then we have then we have all the epistles to kind of refine it. That, that's the whole Bible. Don't do this. And he writes a great big, you know, more than half the Bible is don't do this because this is what happens to people that do that. He said, well, I don't want that stuff to happen to me. What do I do? Because I can't escape my sinfulness. And, and those guys did all, they, they got all that crud in their lives because of their sinfulness. I can't escape that. And then Jesus comes along and says, well, this is how you escape sin. You, you accept my marriage proposal. And then you're no longer held by the law. And then he says, then this is what you do. And he starts out in, in Mark 16 and tells us what we're supposed to do. These signs will follow them that, 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 that are in Christ. And then, and then he goes on to Acts and says, let me reinforce that by telling you what happened when they actually did this stuff. And then he, then, then he refines it a little bit and gives us some hints on, on what to do. I, I mean, think about it. Think about it. Your parents raised you up. So don't run in the street. You get hit by a car. See that dog laying there all mashed or that... That raccoon there laying all mashed or, or skunk laying there all mashed. That'd be you if you run out in the street. You don't want to be all mashed like that. And that's what the Old Testament is. You want to be all mashed like that? Don't run in the street. Well, then what do I do, Dad? And they said, well, this is what you do. This is how you live your life. This is how you, this is the, this is the right things to do. This is how to get light through life the right way. And you say, okay, that's what I'll do. And, and we have certain level of success by how much we paid attention and how much our dad knew about success and, and the other people that had input in our lives. And then we begin to live it, and we live it by looking at other people and saying, what do they do? How do they succeed? How does, how does their life work out right? Right? And, and, then, and then we tweak it throughout the rest of our lives. That, that's this whole book is right here. But it's not about our lives. It's about Christianity. It's about seeing the word, word of God work in the church. It's about becoming a supernatural being. I was thinking, I want to get to a point that, that miracles and all that, it's just second nature to me. And I was praying, I thought, no, I don't want it to be second nature. I want it to be first nature to me. I want this flesh to be second nature. I want, I want the Word of God and the truths that are in the Word of God to be first nature to me. Zacharias said this in 4.6, then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Margie was saying that at Thursday night prayer. She quoted that scripture, Not by might, not by power, my, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We're trying to do it through might, we're trying to do it through power, we're trying to do it through some recipe that's in the word of God. And then when that doesn't work, we say, Oh, I guess it's all by the Spirit of the Lord, so that means that He just does stuff. No. He puts His Spirit in us, and He does stuff through us. By my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. His Spirit operating in us. In Mark 16, 20, I'm about to end my message. This is amazing. This was only two pages. Usually I have four. I've got two pages, and we're still taking just as much time as we do. Four pages. Because this is there's so much in here. There's so much stuff I got. You know, look at... What I, what I do is bold in here. What I do is bold. And what is scripture is not bold because I can, it fits better on the page that way. So look at this sermon. Here's scripture. Here's bold. Here's bold. Here's scripture. Here's scripture. Here's scripture. Here's scripture. Then you turn the page. Oh, there's a little bit of bold at the bottom down there. You turn the page and look at this. Scripture, 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 scripture. And then at the bottom of the page, a little bit of bold. All we've been talking about is not anything I have in my notes. We've been talking about the Word of God and what the Word of God says. And we've got to get to a place where that's the preeminent thing in our thought processes and in our hearts. Not what we make up, not what some other man makes up, not what somebody teaches us to try and water this down, but what it actually says. Mark 16, 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with and confirming the Word with signs following. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thus, we are supernatural yet human manifestations of the living God here on earth. Thus, we are supernatural yet human manifestations of the living God here on earth with all abilities of Jesus. Oh, pastor. 
All the ability is Jesus when he was the supernatural manifestation of God living here on earth. Same thing. The only thing we don't have to do is die on the cross. He did that for us. And, and rightfully so. Why would we die on the cross? What would that prove? What would that prove? He already died on the cross. He was the perfect manifestation of God and the law on earth. He died on the cross. Took all the law with him. Then we marry the other guy, the one that came resurrected up. Woo, the other guy. Jesus is the same guy. Well, before he before before he went raised from the dead, before he was raised from the dead, he walked in water, but he didn't walk through walls. After he was saved, didn't say anything about walking on I mean, after he was saved. After he was resurrected, he was saved all the time. After he was resurrected, it talked about him walking through walls and showing from places where he wasn't, and then he was. And then Philip did the same thing. And, you know, so it's <clears throat> It's all about changing stinking thinking into good thinking and then getting that good thinking into our hearts where there's this... See, we have this thing right somewhere right in here. It's about our throat level. And, and it's doubt and unbelief. See? And we get these things in our brain and we say, yeah, Pastor, that's true, but why isn't that happening? See, we hit that doubt and unbelief. Why don't I see that happening in my life? I don't know. Don't care. It doesn't have anything to do with it. It really doesn't. The manifestation of those things in, in our individual lives has nothing to do with it. It's what is the church doing? What's the body of Christ doing? And, and it's like, okay, I can't let my personal experiences block what should be in my heart. I can't let my personal experiences block. But, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. That's not, that's not reasonable. God isn't reasonable. He wants to show you things that you don't understand, that you don't know anything about. He wants to show you stuff that you haven't figured out about Him. Because there ain't no figuring Him out. We ain't going to have Him figured out for eternity. We're not going to figure Him out. But we're going to be with Him. We're going to see the manifestation of His, of his power in the universe in oh, just ways we can't even imagine or think. So what we want to do now is we want to take communion. And when we take communion, what I want to do with taking communion today is, is I, want you to, I want you to just think about the fact that he died and then he resurrected again. He gave his body, he gave his blood for what? So that you're no longer bound by the law. So why do we keep binding ourselves with the law? So we're going to take communion today and we're going to make a commitment that we're going to do whatever is necessary to let the Holy Spirit change our stinking thinking into true power experiences of God. Because that's what's going to change the world. That's what's going to change the world. Not good stories and, and nice little stories and all that kind of stuff. They're great. But what's going to really change the world is the power. You know, I got saved because I saw the power of God working in my wife's life. I saw such a changed individual that, that I felt, to be honest, I, I felt safer around her and her relationship with me. And I, and I felt like I was less likely to, to, you know, to fail at my marriage because now I had somebody to succeed with me in that marriage. And not that she was awful or different before, but it, it gave me that hope. And that's what I said, I want what she has, because she has a, she has a joy that seems um, inherent to who she is now instead of based on her circumstances in life. And I saw that joy, that natural joy that came from the presence of the Holy Spirit in her, and I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Because what? I saw the power of God operating in her life. I saw the power of God operate in her life, and it made me want what she had. It's the power of God that will make people want Jesus Christ. So, today, just, just think about that. He gave his flesh and he gave his blood so that you would no longer be bound by the law. That you would no longer be bound. He gave his flesh and his blood so that you no longer be bound by the law. Sounds like I'm repeating myself. But evidently we need that. So let's we'll put off the camera and everything.